The October beta release for Home Assistant is already here, with the full release due on Wednesday the 2nd of October. And so as always, I'm going to go through some of the features for this release, which includes 12 new integrations, a nice new heading card for the sections view, and a couple of new features for existing integrations. At first glance of the release notes, it looks like it's quite a light release, but there are actually quite a lot of one-liners with some good new features and changes. Just bear in mind that this is based on the beta release, and so a few bits might change before the final release. So let's dive in. Let's start off with what's probably the most exciting change for this release. If you use the sections view, then you'll already know that you can name your sections so that it's more obvious what cards are in that section. This is definitely useful, but it's a bit of a waste of precious space, especially on a mobile device. So they have now added a new card called the heading card, but it has a lot more functionality than the name suggests. You can set it as a title or a subtitle, with the subtitle having slightly smaller text. You can also choose an icon which shows to the left of the text, but the interactions and entity sections is where it becomes really useful. If you change the tap behaviour of interactions, then you'll see an arrow that appears to the right of the heading text. This allows you to click the heading text to navigate to a different dashboard view, a specific URL, or you can even get to perform any Home Assistant action. I imagine that the most common thing for this though will be navigating to a different view or a different sub view. Below that is the entity section which allows you to display the state of different devices to the right of the heading text. If you use a section for each room for example then this could be really useful to show the state of devices in that room. You can add multiple entities and then if you click the pencil to the right of each entity you can configure various things for that specific entity. You can choose whether it shows the icon for that entity, the state or even when the state was last changed for that entity. You can also set an interaction so that pressing the entity either toggles the device on and off or again performs at any other action in Home Assistant. You can even get it to load the Home Assistant Voice Assistant. And finally, they have included visibility options, meaning that you can set conditions for when that entity shows. For example, you could get it to show just lights that are on within that room. So as you can see, this is not just a heading card, and I really like this new addition, and I'll definitely be using it when I upgrade my production instance. The next change is a tidying up of automation naming conventions so that they make more sense. As you probably know, an automation has three sections to it. There is a trigger section, which defines the things that start the automation. There's an action section, which specifies the things that should happen. And then there's a condition section, which includes criteria that must be met in order order to run these actions. Each of these sections can have multiple triggers, conditions or actions and so these top level sections have now been pluralized and then the children below it are singular. For example you now have a triggers section with one or more trigger items below it. Also each trigger used to be called a platform but this has now been renamed to trigger. Home Assistant is going to continue to support the old name conventions though, so nothing should break if you use the old convention. But when you upgrade, it should update your existing automations that were created in the UI. The next change is something that crops up quite frequently, and that's updates to the matter integration. As you can see here, there is support for a few new entity and device types. It now supports button entities and different operation states. It now also supports smart valves, air quality sensors, and energy related sensors as well. A lot of these features also depend on what your matter devices actually can do themselves. And a lot of manufacturers are still trying to keep pace with all these different revisions of the standard, which is currently on Matter 1.3 and the Thread 1.4 standard has just been released as well. So I would say if you're using Matter and Thread devices, then definitely expect to have some varied experience between different device types for at least the next year or two. So now back to UI related changes, I don't find myself going into YAML mode too often anymore, but when I do I'm always very careful to ensure that my indentation is correct, because otherwise things can break and it's hard to find what you've done wrong. Well this new feature will be welcome for anyone who finds themselves playing around with YAML in their dashboards, because similar to Visual Studio Code Editor, you will now be shown a line for the block of code you are in to help you ensure that you have the correct indentation, as well as being able to 
expand and collapse the different sections. I would often copy my entire YAML into a different editor, make the changes and then paste it back again, but I probably won't need to do this anymore. A simple thing that has been added for this release as well is for repair issues. Home Assistant creates repair issues when it finds something that you need to look into and fix. The Spook Toolbox integration, which I highly recommend, also creates repair issues and also allows you to create your own repair issues as well. So now repair issues as of this release will actually tell you what integration it was that created that repair issue. Before we talk about the new integrations, there are a few other things that caught my eye for this release. One of them is information that is provided when renaming a device. Once I've adopted a Zigbee device, I'll usually rename it straight away, but sometimes I'll have a play with it first and then I'll rename it once I've had a play around with it and decided what I'm actually doing with the device. Renaming a device can mean a lot of entity name changes, and if you've already created automations for the device, then it means that you've got to go into these automations and change those as well. So now the rename process will actually show you what the entity names will change from and to before you actually make the change. So I think this is a really simple but nice addition. Another one is a new entity called Assist Satellite. You can currently build a home assistant voice assistant using an ESP32 or a Raspberry Pi. But the reason that this feature is exciting is because it suggests that Nabucasa is getting closer to releasing their own voice assistant hardware. The current options that are available are fun to play with, but typically they've got quite a few limitations. So I'm really looking forward to them releasing this and hopefully it will be a fully fledged voice assistant. If you do some more complex automation, then the new merge response function might be useful as it allows you to merge multiple responses into one object. This is the kind of thing that I tend to turn to node red for instead, but I definitely prefer to have most of my automations in one place, so this could be useful. And the final one I wanted to mention is that trigger-based templates now support conditions. I don't actually use this functionality, and you might not either, but it could well be something worth looking into. Basically, they allow you to update sensors based on a trigger. So this could be just updating a sensor on a time interval, or it could be something more complex, such as actually using an incoming webhook to update a sensor from an external system. Now here's a list of the new integrations for this release. The Google Photos one allows you to upload new photos from Home Assistant to Google Photos. It mentions that photos you've uploaded from Home Assistant can be cast to a media device, but unfortunately you apparently don't get access to your whole media library in Google Photos, which seems a bit of a shame and maybe they can get somewhere around this in the future. There is also an integration called Trigger CMD now, which is an application that allows you to send commands to your computer remotely. It seems like it could be a useful integration, but it is cloud based rather than local, so unfortunately, I won't be looking into this one very much myself. A couple of existing integrations have received some updates. The Tesla fleet integration that was introduced a couple of months ago has now got new entities available, and quite a lot of them by the looks of it. Rio Link is quite a popular camera brand, and if you have their hub, then you can now control the volume and ringtone. And similarly, if you use ring devices, you can now control the volume of these devices as well. And the final change is to the SwitchBot cloud integration. I've got a lot of SwitchBot devices, but I don't use this integration because there's also a local SwitchBot integration, which works well for me. And for all the other SwitchBot devices, I tend to use the Matter integration instead. However, when it comes to the robot vacuums, unfortunately the matter integration is very poor and only has an on-off toggle, which is next to useless. So this integration has now got support for the K10 Plus vacuum, so it might be worth looking at this so I can integrate it into Home Assistant properly. Looking at backwards incompatible changes, I couldn't see anything really major for this month, so that's it for this video, and thanks until next time.